Good morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. And our first song is Amazing Grace. Uh, this is Chris Tomlin's My Chains Are Gone. this time together. Just thank you for the opportunity that we have to, to bring your word. Just pray that you'll be with each one of us. Lord, open up our hearts that we might hear you and, and know you and, and surrender our lives to you. Help point out the things that are in our lives that are contrary to, to your word and to your, your holiness, that we might change them, that we might repent of those, of those sins and and give our lives completely over to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we'd like to welcome everybody 
back to our service this morning. Um, again, we're it's just us here in the in the sanctuary. And our you know my wife and our three kids. I've heard a lot of a lot of pastors are um, you know a little bit weary. They're they're showing up to sanctuaries and they're preaching to uh, empty chairs. And I said, well, as a church planner, I've got a lot of experience of showing up on Sunday morning and preaching to empty chairs. So it's it's nothing unusual unusual for us here. So as we continue to press forward with the gospel, um, obviously we, we miss each one of you. Uh, we miss your faces. Uh, we pray that all of you are, are doing well, and we can't wait till the time that we're either able to gather back together. So uh, thank, thank you to everybody last week who, who liked and shared the video. We encourage everybody to do the same thing um, as you like it. It just lets us know that you're out there to kind of check it in. Uh, but then as you share it, it gives everybody an opportunity um, in their part in evangelism. Uh, you share it to your timeline. Uh, somebody that uh, you might not expect might come across it. And it just uh, might prick something in their heart uh, that will lead them to Christ. So I encourage you again to, to like and share uh, these videos um, from whatever church that you're, you're listening to. That way the gospel continues to go out. Um, everywhere that uh, everywhere somebody turns around on social media or on the on the on the internet they are going to stumble you know Christ is a stumbling block to those who don't know him so let's just make it a stumbling block all over social media nobody will be able to log on to Facebook without coming across a sermon about Christ so again encourage everybody to share and like also this week this is what we'd be considered Holy Week e next week next Sunday is Easter Sunday so this Sunday here, it's Palm Sunday. So this is the Sunday that Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem as he rode in on the donkey. It's fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy. This is how the Messiah, the King, was going to enter. So as Jesus makes his entry in Jerusalem, and everybody cheers him on. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then we know just a few short days later, he was crucified as we look forward to that next Friday, Good Friday. And of course, on the third day, he rose again as we celebrate Easter next Sunday. So I'd encourage everybody to spend this week in prayer and in study and in contemplation of God's word. Uh, open up the gospels and read about Jesus's entry into Jerusalem, about his crucifixion, and of course, about his resurrection. Prepare your hearts as we get ready to gather next Sunday and celebrate the resurrection, which is the foundation of our faith. Without the resurrection, um, our faith is, is empty. But we know that the grave is empty. And because of the grave is empty, that our faith and trust in Christ, that we will one day take part in his resurrection as well. For those who have come to faith and trust in Jesus, that on that last day, we too will be resurrected. And we will spend eternity with him forever and ever. So, I encourage you to um, get into God's word this week and prepare your hearts for next Sunday. So as we get back to worship, we worship through song, uh, we worship through prayer, we worship through our giving, and then we worship through the proclamation of God's word. So right now we're going to worship through song. So everybody, I encourage you to um, prepare your hearts and then wherever you're at right now, sing with us as we praise and give glory to God. This next one is called Breathe.
Uh, this next one will be our offertory hymn. It is called How Great Thou Art. <laughs> to encourage you to, to give at this time. You can 
Uh, do it online on our website at www.fbcfredonia.org. Um, at the top, you'll see a button for give. Click on that, it'll take you to the giving page. Um, and there's another tab there that you can press and enter your information to do it online. Um, if you'd rather send it into the church, you can send it to Faith Baptist Church, P.O. Box 441, Fredonia, Kansas, 66736. So I encourage you to uh, continue to uh, send in your tithes and offerings. So let's pray uh, for our offering. Father, we, we thank you for the gifts uh, that you give us. We pray for the, the offering that's coming. We ask that you bless it and we can use it to continue to bring your word uh, to out to the people. We can further your kingdom. Uh, bless those who, uh, who give back uh, according to the, the blessings that you've given them, Father. We just praise you and thank you for sustaining us through this time, and we give all glory to you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible, open up to John chapter 4. We'll be in verses 27 through 45. So the last couple of weeks here, we're going to finish up the conversation that Jesus had with the Samaritan woman. So the last couple of weeks, we've been going through this narrative. So as Jesus was on his way to Galilee, he went through Samaria and they came across this well. Jesus and the disciples were tired. It says that they were weary from traveling. It's noon. It's hot outside. They were hungry and thirsty. So they stopped. And as the disciples go into town to go get food, Jesus encounters this woman at the well. And ask her for a drink. And then through that conversation of back and forth with this woman, Jesus continually engages her, pierces her heart with God's word about this living water that will well up inside of her into eternal life. She's ready to accept it and acknowledge who he is. Over and over again, she has a misunderstanding of what Jesus is telling her. And then last week, her sin needed to be addressed. And he talks about the issue of worship, true worship. And at the end of that conversation, when the woman says, we know when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus announces himself to her that I am the Messiah. And this is where we pick up now in verse 27 through 45. Just then his disciples came back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another one reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After the two days, he departed for Galilee, for Jesus 
himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So as we look back at verse 27 through 30, this takes place immediately after Christ shows himself to this woman. I am the Messiah. And then in verses 27 through 30, the disciples come back and they're marveling that he's speaking to this woman. And then the woman leaves and goes back into town and encounters the people of Sychar. Can this be the Christ? And then it says all of the town were coming out to him. So the story shifts. First it was just Jesus and the woman, but now it shifts. The disciples are in the picture. After Jesus had just revealed himself to this woman as the Messiah. At the beginning of the conversation, he was just a Jewish man wanting a drink of water. And then he was someone who equated himself as better than their ancestor Jacob, who had dug the well. And then he was perceived as a prophet because he knew about this woman's life. And then now he's the Messiah. Many people have this natural progression when they come to Christ. If you don't know him at first, he's just another person. He's just a man that you know. His name is Jesus. And he shows up in this book right here that we call the Bible. He's just a man. But the more you read, the more you understand that he's more than just a man. There's something different about him. You begin to acknowledge that he is some sort of prophet. A prophet is just somebody who speaks on behalf of God. You understand that the things that he says are supernatural. They're not, they're not like what anybody else has ever said. So we perceive he's some sort of prophet. He's a healer. He's a holy man. Somebody who feeds the hungry. Somebody who does miraculous signs. And then the closer that we look at him, the more we look for him, he reveals himself to us, just like he did this woman. And then we see him for who he really is, and that's the Messiah. The Messiah was just God's holy and anointed one that he was going to send forth. And we see for ourselves that this is who Jesus is. The Messiah, God's Son, who has come into the world to take away the sin of the world. For whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The word of God has penetrated her heart. Jesus didn't give up on her after she kept rejecting him and misunderstanding what he was trying to say. No, he continued with God's word and it penetrated her stubborn heart. It penetrated that hardened heart. Jesus was knocking and she finally opened the door. At this time, the disciples come back from town and they marvel that Jesus is talking to this woman. It says they were amazed. Right? Remember, Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with one another. They hated each other. That was number one. Number two, Jesus was a Jewish man. She was a Samaritan woman. Men and women did not talk with one another out in public. That was countercultural to what they're used to. So the disciples are marveling and they have these questions in their mind, but they don't say them out loud. At first, they're wondering, what does this woman want? What do you seek? Why are you talking to him? And then they have a question for Jesus. Why are you talking to her? But they don't say it out loud. It's just what they were thinking. No one dared to ask out loud. Now the scene shifts again. Back to the woman. She got up and went back to town. To tell all the people what just happened. All the while 
leaving her jar of water behind. The whole reason that she went out to the well was to fill her jug of water. And in her haste, she left, leaving the jug at the well. It's because she heard about that living water. The one that she would drink from and never thirst again. The one that would well up inside of her into eternal life. She was no longer concerned about other things because she had just encountered the Messiah, the Son of God. And the only thing for her to do was to run and tell someone else about him. And she was willing to leave everything behind to do it. She goes to town. She says, come and see this man who has told me all that I ever did. Come and see. It's the same invitation that Jesus gave to two of the disciples back in to chapter 1. In chapter 1, verses 35 through 39, when Jesus calls his first disciples, in verse 35, it says the next day again, John, this is speaking of John the Baptist, as he's standing there with the people who are following him, and he sees Jesus walk by. The next day again, John the Baptist was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. Come and see. If you really want to know about this gift that he has, if you really want to know who Jesus is, you have to come and see for yourself. The invitation is there to come and see. It doesn't really matter what anyone else says about him or what anybody else has told you about him. You have to come and see for yourself. You either accept Christ for who he is or you reject him. There is no middle ground. If you have not accepted Christ as your Lord and your Savior, then you have rejected him as such. There's no middle ground of contemplation. Right now, everyone has made a decision for Christ. You've either accepted him as the Son of God, who has come into this world to take away your sin, You've accepted him as your Lord and Savior, or you have not. The good news is, however, that if you have it, you can come and receive him now. If you have not received him, if you have not believed on his name, you can do that now. Come and see. The invitation is there. You can't continually put this invitation off because one day that invitation is going to go away and you will no longer have the opportunity to come and see. For this woman who had every reason to avoid the people of Sychar, she has now come eagerly to bear witness to them. Can this be the Christ? This is the question that everybody must answer for themselves. Is Jesus who he says he is? Right back in 25, verse 25 and 26, the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I am he. Can this be him? Can this be the Christ? The word Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. Messiah is a Hebrew word. Christ is the Greek word. They both mean the same. It means the anointed one, God's holy one. This question in the Greek is in the negative form. Can this be the Christ? So it almost insists on a negative answer. 
She is saying, this couldn't be the Christ, could it? It almost insists on a no, but there's still the hope at the end of it. Couldn't this be him? This woman still trying to process what just happened to her. I think I found the Christ, the long awaited Messiah. But could it really be him? Is this him? She's still wrestling with it in her heart. Her whole world has just been turned upside down. Everything that she thought that she knew and believed in was wrong. She's just encountered the Son of God. And she's still wrestling in her heart and mind on what to do with this information. Is this him? Can this be him? But she's seen and heard enough for her to leave everything behind and go call on the townspeople to come and see for themselves. Come and see. You have to come and see for yourself and answer that question yourself. Is this the Christ? It stirred the whole hearts of the town. She witnessed to them. She gave her testimony. And now they're all they went out of the town and were coming to him. They're all coming to see him. The disciples went into town and brought back bread. This woman went into town and brought back men. Leading people back to the Christ. Can this be him? Upon hearing the gospel, it demands a response. You have to respond to it. You either accept it or you reject it. Either way, it demands a response. She responded by going to get other people to come back and see for themselves. Can this be the Christ? Before Jesus told her that if she wanted this living water to go get your husband and bring him back here also. If you knew the gift that I had, if you only knew who I was, you would be asking me for water. And now she knows. She sees it. She understands. But she didn't go back into town to get her husband because she didn't have one. She didn't go back to town to get the man that she was living with no, she went back and got the whole town. Because once you know that gift, once you know who Jesus really is, you want everyone else to know. Come and see. Can this be the Christ? In verses 31 through 38, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say that there are four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here, the saying holds true, one sows and another one reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you do not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Again, the story shifts again. Now it's back to Jesus and his disciples. First it was Jesus and the woman, and then it shifted to the disciples, and then back to the woman and the people of the town. Now it's back to Jesus. John the Evangelist, our gospel writer here, he's weaving these narratives into one another. They stopped because they were tired. They've been traveling all morning. It's hot outside. They were hungry and they were thirsty. They were weary. Jesus was weary. Jesus. 
So the disciples went into town to get food. And upon their return, they tried to give some of it to Jesus. And he said that he had food that they didn't know about. And just like Nicodemus and the woman at first, they took it literally. Has anyone brought him something to eat? Just like Nicodemus in chapter 3, when Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, Can a man enter his mother's womb and be born a second time? Jesus tells the woman, If you knew who I was, you'd ask me for a drink of living water that would well up inside of you into eternal life. Her response was, Howard, can you give me this water when you don't have anything to dip in the well and draw water with? Now the disciples take and misunderstand Jesus too. I have food to eat that you don't know about. Did somebody bring him something while we were gone? Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And we can see this in Matthew chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, at the beginning, it's the temptation of Jesus. He'd just been baptized. And he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, it says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Right? Just like in John chapter 4. He'd been traveling. He's hungry. Now he had been fasting. He's hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But still the issue with food. But look what Jesus answered. It is written. Jesus quotes scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus had just had a whole meal of doing God's will. He's been satisfied because he just did what he was sent to do. And that was to bring salvation into the world. He just led the Samaritan woman into eternal life. And then now he can look up and see the whole town is now coming out to him. This is what satisfies my hunger by doing God's will in my life. Leading one person to eternity. And now Jesus can look up and see in a distance that the whole town is now coming to him. And then he shifts the disciples' attention to the opportunity at hand. Right? We can read weather patterns. We know the seasons of planting and harvesting. Jesus said, look up and see that the harvest is ready now. We're so worried about earthly things that we can miss these heavenly opportunities. Jesus said, look up and see. And I'm sure as he's saying this, he's gesturing or pointing to this large crowd that is now on their way out to him. Look and see. The harvest is ready. Right now, during this time, everybody's hungry for hope. For many people, this is a time of great uncertainty. They're looking for something, something to hold on to. Something to grasp of. Something to cling on to. Jesus said, look up and see. The harvest is ready. Right now we can be what's in the midst of this next great awakening in this country. The next great revival. All we have to do is look up and see that there is a harvest out there. Right now our focus is somewhere else. We're looking down of all these things, all these 
cares that we have in the world right now. Scrambling around for all these things. When God is just telling us, be still and know that I am God. Quit looking down at all these other things. Lift up your eyes and look out. There's a harvest that's ready right now. If you would just look up and see. Jesus speaks about a harvest in Matthew 9. In verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. This is a different time and a different place than where he is in John chapter 4 in Samaria. But undoubtedly, he looked up and saw that crowd coming from the Samaritan city, and he had compassion on them as well. Because they were harassed and helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. A sheep without a shepherd is lost. All these lost sheep out there that Jesus looks out on and has compassion for because they're helpless. They're harassed. And he has compassion. Sheep without a shepherd. He says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. There is a harvest to be had right now. Most people say, what can I do? I am just one person. So is this woman of Samaria. And she has the whole town coming to Jesus. So was Jonah when he preached at Nineveh and it says that the whole city came to know God. 120,000 people because of one man went to go preach the gospel. In verse 36, Jesus says, already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. There's already a gathering taking place. The reapers are receiving their wages by bringing the fruit of eternal life. During this time, the reaper would only get paid after the job. So Jesus is saying they're already receiving their wages because they're already reaping. There are people out there that are reaping the harvest right now. And they are receiving that reward. That fruit, gathering fruit for eternal life. So that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together because there can't not be one without the other. Sometimes we spend a lifetime sowing and never see the results of the harvest. Sowing is hard work. It's toiling day after day to get the seed planted, to get it to take root, to water it, to nurse it, to help it grow. Sometimes we sow and sometimes we reap. We must always remember that whenever we reap, it's because someone else's labor went into sowing that seed. That's why the two must work together. That's why the two rejoice together. Some people sow all their lives the seed of the gospel and never see any fruit from it. But then sometimes there are others who come behind them and they harvest that crop and then the two rejoice together because all that hard work is now worth it. Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send more laborers out into the harvest because the fields are white. They're ready now. 39 through 45, it said, Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with him. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, 
For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. After two days he departed for Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. When he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, where they too had gone to the feast. The scene shifts back to the Samaritan people. Many people believe because of one woman's testimony. Not a great woman, not a religious woman, a godly woman, somebody who held respect within that city, quite the opposite, an outcasted woman. A woman that nobody else wanted anything to do with. That's why she went out to the well by herself. But she came to Christ. And because of her testimony, many Samaritans from that town believed. Because of one person, a whole town was changed. For eternity. All it takes is one person to lead many to Christ, to invite someone to come and to see. And it tells us that many more believe because of Jesus' word, right? We lead them to Christ, but only he can save them. We lead people to Jesus. That's all we can do. After that, it's between them and God. We let them decide. Right in verse 42, they said to the woman, so longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world, that invitation to come and see that they believed. They come and saw, and it's because of what they saw and what they heard, they believe for themselves. Everybody has to believe for themselves. Because only Jesus can make a person declare him as their savior. We cannot come to faith by hearing what Jesus does for someone else. It can lead us to him, but we come to faith by personally knowing what he has done for us. And Jesus did what he set out to do when he crossed through Samaria. Right back in, all the way at the beginning in verse three and four, he left Judea in verse three, and departed again for Galilee. In verse 4, he had to pass through Samaria. Jesus had to go. Because this is where that woman was going to be. The encounter with one woman led to a whole city coming to faith. Because that was the will of the Father. That's what Jesus came to do was to save. We can lead people to Christ, but only he can save them. And it says he stayed with them for two days and then departed for Galilee. We have a tremendous opportunity right now for us to share our faith with an uncertain world right now. The harvest is Plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send more laborers out into the harvest. Maybe he is calling you to be one of those laborers. Somebody that wants to come and help. God has called you to something greater. Maybe he has called you to be one of the harvested. Up until this point, you'd never made a decision for Christ, but you're ready. Everybody makes a decision for Christ. Everybody. We either acknowledge that we're sinners in need of a Savior, or we don't. Either way, that's the decision that we make. Because if you only knew the gift of God, if you only knew who Jesus was, then you would come running to him. 
for that living water. The water that wells up inside of you into eternal life. The water that caused this woman to drop everything and to run and tell everyone about it. Her life was changed immediately. She went from an outcast that avoided the crowd to an evangelist that brought the crowd back with her. You see, that's what happens to you when you come to faith. A true and genuine repentance takes place and you turn away from your sinfulness. You run towards Jesus who has that living water. And you want to drink. Because if you know who he is, this is what you would do. You would drop everything and come running. Look up and see that there are many people ready right now and willing to come to him. But they just need a little bit help getting there. That's what all these laborers are needed for. Jesus calls us all to go and make disciples. Can this be the Christ? This is the question that you must answer for yourself. If Jesus is the Savior of the world, is he? Because if you don't know that yet, then the invitation is there to come and see. Come and see for yourself. Don't take somebody else's word for it. Don't just completely dismiss it because of someone else's word. Because that's what your friends do or your parents do or your children do. Come and see for yourself. Is this the Christ? Come and see who he is. Could he be the Christ? The Savior of the world? The invitation is for you to come and see. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to proclaim your word. We pray that it goes out and it penetrates the hearts of those who hear it. We know that there's a harvest. We pray for the laborers. We pray to you, the Lord of the harvest, that you will send out more laborers. That there are many people out there that are ready. They just need help, guidance. We pray for those out there that you will raise up more laborers to come take in your harvest. Lord, continue to be with us each and every day. We pray for those who are listening, that you will bless them, bless their faithfulness for their continued giving and their continued listening to your word. We praise your name and we give all glory to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never come to that point in your life where you've given your life to Christ, then we pray that now's the time. Everybody makes a decision for Christ. You either make a decision and accept him as Lord and Savior, or you've made the decision that you've not accepted him. Therefore, you've rejected him. There's no such thing as in between. If you're ready to make that decision, then please reach out to me, reach out to someone. And we can speak to you about it. Speak to you about being baptized if you've never been baptized. We pray for each one of you as we go through this week. We look forward to gathering again next week. Next Sunday is Easter as we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Be in his word this week. Because there were things that happened before the resurrection. Don't forget the crucifixion. Of what it took in order for him to take our sins away. He was whipped and beaten and scourged and then nailed to a cross. Not because of his sin, but because of our sin. 
right? In order, before we're raised with Christ, we die with Christ first. We die to ourselves. We die for the sinful person that's in us. We have to come to that recollection first. We die to self in order to be raised with him into a newness of life. So think about this week. Before we celebrate the resurrection, let's contemplate the crucifixion. And we'll see you guys again next Sunday. If you need anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Right now we're going to worship through song one more time. And then after that, we'll see everybody again back here next week at 1030. See you next week.